Today, what I'd like to talk to you about is God's law nailed to the cross. Now, I'm relatively sure that most of us here believe that God's laws are still in effect. However, many churches believe that through Christ, the law was done away with, was nailed to the cross. Now, my wife and I have had discussions with our grandson. We, we raised one of our grandchildren who attends a Baptist church concerning uh, this is issue. He goes to the Baptist church because he's been around uh, he, a lot of his friends in school and everything. They're, they're his good friends. So they, they attend this church. And I will tell you, there's others that uh, I meet with on occasion when I go to Florida, and a lot of questions come up regarding the question and brings up certain scriptures like Acts 15, 28, and 29. I'm not going to go into that right now. But are you prepared to address this issue if questioned about the law? If someone came to you and questioned you about the law and said, you know, I, I believe, according to Paul, that the law was done away with. Well, let's take a look at what the Bible actually says about this issue so that we can be prepared to have that discussion when somebody brings these things up. Now, first of all, let's turn to just a few of the scriptures that are used to justify that the law indeed has been done away. Let's begin by turning to Romans 10. Romans 10. And I'm going to begin in verse 4. Here in verse 4, Romans 10, verse 4, it says, For Christ is the end of the works of law. Notice that term works, the end of works for, of law, for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, it certainly appears here that Christ is the end of works of law. We'll take a look at that in a minute. Now, my grandson says that he is a Gentile, and therefore, if you're a Gentile, the law does not to apply to him as it does to the Jews. Okay. But then, when you drop down to verse 12, pay attention here, when it drops down to verse 12, it says, for there is no difference between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all is rich toward all who call upon him. Now, now, just back up a few pages, just back up a few pages to Romans 6 and verse 14. It says, For sin shall not rule over you, because you are not under law, but under grace. Notice what Paul says in the next verse. This is important. What does he say in the next verse? What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? Now notice, notice what Paul says next. May it never be. Now, Paul makes it pretty clear here that we are not to sin. So then, what, what is sin? Well, we can turn to John 1 and verse 3. Just turn to John 1 and verse 3, and, and beginning at verse 4. What does it say about sin? It says, everyone who practices sin is also practicing lawlessness. And here's your definition, for sin is lawlessness. If there's no laws, you can't sin. Now, let me, let me quote that again this time. In the King James Version, just a different perspective. Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. So we see here that the definition of sin is to violate God's law. Clear definition. If there is no law, 
there is no sin. You know, I, I doubt seriously if anyone who claims to be a Christian is going is to argue with you that it's a sin to murder or to commit adultery or to steal or to bear, bear false witness. We could go through all of those. Or who would argue that we are not to worship false gods or use the Lord's name in vain? I, I mean, we could we could go through all these. These are indeed all sins. And according to John, a violation of God's law, plain and clear. Now, a lot of churches don't like the fourth commandment, but it goes along with all the others. It goes along with all the others, the fourth commandment. So, if we violate these commandments, plain and simple, we sin. And if we do, in so doing, and it is sin, then the commandments are God's walls. Very simply put, violating God's commandments is a sin, and sin is a violation of the law. So let's take a look at what God's Word, the Bible, says about the commandments. As we don't keep them, we're breaking the law. Before we leave sin alone, before we go there, let's turn to Romans 6. Let's turn to Romans 6. And I'm going to begin in verse 1 of Romans 6. So we can see actually what Paul says about sin. Well, here's what he said. Again, it's in Romans 6. Let's begin in verse 1. Paul says, What then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Notice what he said. May that never be. We who died to sin, continuing on, we, we who died to sin, how shall we live any longer therein? You see, Paul makes it pretty clear here that we are not to break God's walls because it's sin. Now, just, just one more scripture to make it crystal clear that we are not to sin, and sin is a violation of God's laws. In Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, and in verse 1, here Paul says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great throng of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily traps us, and let us run the race set before us with endurance. Now, is it not clear at this point that sin requires law? And to violate God's law is sin. And it is clear that the Ten Commandments are God's laws. Very clear. They summarize, actually, the two greatest commandments of all. Number one, that we shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And the second one, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's a summary. Now, with all that said, let us see if we are to keep God's commandments, which are certainly God's laws. Now, since most use the Apostle Paul to justify that, that the law has been done away with, let's take a look at a few of Paul's words to see what he says about God's commandments. Let's turn. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7. And let me begin in verse 19. Now here, Paul is discussing the practice of circumcision. I understand that. But notice what he has to say about the commandments. Paul says, for circumcision, it's nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. Rather, the keeping of God's commandments is essential. Pretty clear. 
let each abide in the calling in which he was called. Now, Paul here is certainly not telling us that we are not to keep God's laws. He's not telling us that. Now, notice in 1 Thessalonians 4, notice in 1 Thessalonians 4 that Paul gave them a commandment through Jesus Christ not to practice fornication. Beginning in verse 2, again, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 2. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus, because this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain, you abstain from fornication, abstain from fornication. Pretty clear here that the commandments of God do apply. However, Paul does specifically talk about the commandments being an old. He talks about that. In Ephesians 2, and in verse 15, Paul says, having annulled in his flesh, speaking here of the death of Christ, the enmity, the law of commandments contained, and here in the Greek it should read, in the decrees of men, so that he himself, he might create both, into one new man making peace. Now, he is not referring to the commandments of God. And the enmity of the law is the mutual hatred of the law and its death penalty separating us from God. Now, notice again what Paul says in Colossians 2. And I'm using a lot of these scriptures with Paul because... That's, they use it to justify it. In Colossians 2, and in verse 20 of Colossians 2, here it says, Therefore, if you have died together with Christ from the elements of the world, why are you subjecting yourself to the decrees of men? Notice that, the decrees of men, as if you were living in the world. They say, you may not handle, you may not taste, you may not touch. The use of all such things lead to corruption. He's talking about man-made laws here. According to the commandments and the doctors of men made it very clear who he's talking about here. One of these at the scribes and the Pharisees, and they all put these things together. They were not biblically based. So here Paul is clearly talking about all the traditions, the philosophies, and the deceitful ideas of them. In other words, not God's laws. Now back up to verse 8. Back up to verse 8. Here's what he tells us. Paul says, be on guard that no one takes you captive through philosophy and vain deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the elements of the world, and not according to Christ. Now notice in verse 12, notice in verse 12, concerning our baptism, having been buried with him in baptism, which we were, by which you have also been raised with him through the in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And now in verse 13, talking about the result of our baptism, he says, For you, who were once dead in your sins, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, has made you alive with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, through baptism, through baptism, like Christ, we were buried, we died, and we came out of that watery grave forgiven of our sins. Now notice verse 14. What was actually nailed to the cross? 
he says, he has blotted out the note of debt against us with the decrees of our sins, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it away, having nailed it to the cross. Pretty clear. Because of sin, we were all under the penalty of death, but Christ paid the penalty for all humanity, and he nailed our sins to the cross. That's what was nailed to the cross. He took the penalty of those sins upon himself, and he nailed them to the cross. He did not nail the lands to the cross. Well, let's, let's put this in the proper perspective. We have lands in this country. If you murder or you steal, you pay a penalty. We have laws. You probably would go to jail, and again, depending on the crime, you could actually face the death penalty. And believe it or not, at one time, we actually have laws against fortification and adultery. You know, when I was in Norfolk, Virginia, when I first couple of years I was in the U.S. Navy, I'm guessing somewhere around 1962, if you were found with a woman other than your wife in a motel room, you were arrested and you went to jail. Now, in the case of state law, you can be pardoned by the governor and released from that penalty of the crime, including, including the death penalty. And, of course, the president of the United States has the same authority with federal law. However, being forgiven and released from jail or the death penalty did not annul the law, did not stop or change the law. You were forgiven, but the law was not done away with. Same is true for us. Through repentance and baptism, we are freed from the penalty of eternal death for those sins that we committed, but did not do away with God's laws that we violated. We've been forgiven. Now notice what Paul had to say about the future of God's laws in the book of Hebrews. The future. In Hebrews 8 and verse 8. In Hebrews 8 and verse 8, he tells us, he said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And then he gives us that new covenant in verse 10 when he says, For this is the covenant that I will establish with the house of Israel after those days. Says the Lord, I will give my laws into their minds, and I will inscribe them upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Apparently, Paul didn't have a problem with God's laws. After all, he also repeated this in Hebrews 10 and verse 16. So, if the laws were good in the past, they're still going to be valid in the future. Very clear. Why on earth would they be done away? They identify sin. Now, up until now, we have focused on Paul's writing since those are the ones used to justify the law being done away with. Very clearly not. However, let's take a look at what John had to say about the keeping of God's commandments. No confusion with John concerning this issue whatsoever. And I don't know why they, they just don't seem to like the book of, of, of 1 John. But let's turn to 1 John. 1 John 2, and beginning at verse 1, it says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin.'" 
Here again, John is telling us that we're not to sin. The violation of God's law. He continues on. He says, and yet, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So, apparently, as long as we are in the flesh, we can sin. But notice that Christ continues atoning for those sins when we get to verse 2, and it says, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And then again, notice what he tells us in verse 3. He says, and by this standard, we know that we know him. How do we know if we know him? If we keep his commandments. The one who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not any. Very clear. You know, we may slip up from time to time, but we have Christ as, our, as an advocate sitting to the right hand of God the Father to intercede on our behalf. However, we are not to practice sin. That doesn't mean it's okay to sin. We, we are not to practice sin. If we, if we turn over to chapter 3 and verse 22, chapter 3 and verse 22, it says, And whatever we ask, we receive from him. Why? Because we keep his commandments, and we practice those things that are pleasing in his sight. Any indication here sin, that, 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 that the sins done away, the laws were done away? Turn to chapter 5, where John reminds us of the two greatest commandments. In verses 2 and 3, chapter 5, John says, By this standard we know that we love the children of God when we love God and we keep his commandments. Done away with? Verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And notice, notice, notice the rest of the statement. And his commandments are not burdensome. Keeping God's laws or commandments is not something that we can't do. Notice just a page over, one page over in 2 John. And verse 6, 2 John and verse 6. And this is the love of God. This is the love of God that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment. Exactly as you heard from the beginning that you might walk in it. Why is it so difficult to see God's commandments and his statutes and his laws that they're good and that they're righteous? And keeping them is not a burden. Now, up until now, we've just taken the word of the apostles. But how about the very words of Jesus Christ? Christ's word should, should close the argument concerning keeping the laws and the commandments. If we turn to Matthew 5, and beginning in verse 17. Matthew 5, beginning in verse 17. It says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Done away with. Verse 18, for truly, I say to you, until the heaven and the earth pass away, which that has not happened, one jot or one tittle shall in no way pass from the law until everything has been fulfilled. Heaven and the earth have certainly not passed away as far as I know. And notice now in verse 19, notice in verse 19 how he clarifies that the commandments are law. In verse 19, therefore, whoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall practice, practice, which means to keep, 
and to teach them. This one shall be called great in the kingdom of God. These are serious things to look at, brother. Now, I don't know how much stronger you can get than that. Then in Matthew 19, we know the story of the young man uh, that came to Christ and asked what he had to do to enter into the kingdom of God. What have I got to do? And then Christ mentioned some of the Ten Commandments. Now, he didn't mention all of them, and a lot of people use that and say, oh, well, you know, that's why we don't have to keep the first four commandments. He, did, he, didn't, he didn't mention those. But in verse 17, he told him, he said, if you desire to enter into life, keep the commandments. Commandments are law, God's law. Actually, I like Luke's account of the little a little better because it also tells a little bit more about who is asking the question. And in Luke 18, in, in Luke 18 and verse 18, Luke 18, verse 18, it tells us, and a certain ruler asked him, so he was a ruler, and he asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And notice that Christ told this ruler, you know the commandments. You know the commandments. So if we desire to inherit eternal life, we are to keep God's commandments. Now, in the Gospel of John, Christ tells us in chapter 14, chapter 14, and verse 15, it says, If you love me, keep the commandments. Namely, my commandments. Could it be any clearer? And in John 15 and verse 10, that's 15 and verse 10, Christ tells us, If you keep my commandments, you shall live in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and live in his love. What an opportunity for Christ to say, Look, look we, did, we did away with those commandments. That isn't what he says. Just one more scripture from the book of John. We often hear about how Paul changed the Sabbath. Won't find that anywhere. And he did away with the law. Did, first of all, did he have the authority to do that? Please no, notice what Jesus Christ had to say about authority in John 5. And verse 30, in John 5 and verse 30, he says, I have no power to do anything of myself. Notice that. He didn't even have the power to do anything of myself. But as I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Brethren, nobody has the power to change the will of God, but God the Father himself. Now, surely you would think that this is the end of the story. But Christ had a few more words to say when he revealed it to John in the book of Revelation. Notice chapter 14, book of Revelation, chapter 14, and in verse 12, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are the ones who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven say to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from this time forward. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, and from works, and their works follow them. In other words, those, those works are the keeping of God's laws and his commandments. Loving God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind and all your being, and loving your neighbors, because that's the Ten Commandments summarized. But the end of the story and the result of keeping God's commandments 
the, or all the commandments of God are finally found in Revelation 22. And let's begin in verse 12. Revelation 22 and verse 12. Notice Christ says here, he's, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to each one according as his work shall be. And he, and he goes on to say, he says, I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And what are those works that Christ is talking about? He gives us that answer in verse 14, makes it very clear. He said, blessed are those who keep his commandments, that they may have the right to eat of the tree of life and may enter into the gate by the gates into the city. Brother, it's, it's pretty clear if you read the whole Bible and not just one or two scriptures that the walls were never nailed to the cross. Now, I'm just, I was really proud of my wife because she stood up when a friend of our, our grandson came in and he asked that question as well. And that city that we just read about, brother, is God's kingdom. Keeping the laws and the commandments, it's not a burden. It's not something we can't do. We may slip up from time to time. We're not to practice sin, and we may slip up from time to time and, and immediately repent and ask forgiveness. We're not going to be perfect in all aspects of the law. But we are not to practice it anymore. We are not to practice sin. Those that desire to be part of God's kingdom will keep the commandments of God. So, brethren, I tell you, if your question on your beliefs, always be prepared to answer the question. Is God's law nailed to the cross? And I think with just some of the scriptures we've covered here, it's absolutely clear that that is not true. So, brethren, I pray you all have a wonderful Sabbath day.